Hi, this is Andrew Marty from SACS, and the subject today is change management. This presentation is called Change Without Pain. What we're going to do is to take you through an evidence-based review of what we know about change, what happens in the human brain when change needs to occur, and we're going to explain to you some methods that you might like to consider using so that you can make your change efforts more successful. So first, let's tell you a little bit about SACS. SACS is an organizational psychology business. We're involved in psychological testing. This is the main part of our business, the biggest part of our business. We undertake well-being surveys, psychological testing at an individual level, 360 degree feedback. In addition to that, we're very heavily involved in organizational and individual development. So change management, coaching, career transition management, and workforce planning is a very key area of our interest. We're involved in recruitment process design and delivery. So we recruit for organizations, but we also build recruitment methodologies for organization. And we're involved in a thing called the scientist practitioner model, which means that we are primary researchers as well as providers of services. And our main university partner is Deakin University. And so basically what we do is we take an evidence-based approach to people management. And so you'll see in the course of this presentation that we'll draw heavily on the world of research. So our objectives of this presentation, four of them, why do people vary in their receptiveness to change? Uh, preconditions to change, engagement. We're gonna talk about the degree to which people are having experiences which gen engender positive emotions in them and the effect that this has on their change readiness. We're then gonna dig into a thing called the neuroscience of change. We're gonna to explain to you a little bit what happens in the human brain when change takes place. And we're going to give you along the way a range of practical change management tips and techniques which you can use back in your workplace. So here is, just to cut to the chase, here is the most important three words you're going to see in this entire presentation. And those three words are change is learning. Now, that mightn't sound like much, but most people, most organisations do not run change management undertakings as learning exercises. They undertake them as persuasion exercises. They undertake them as exercises in the force of reason. You know, they reason people into changing. They coerce people into changing. Very few organizations set up their change efforts as learning activities. Now, why do we say that change is learning? If you ask people to change something that they do and you've hooked them up to one of the contemporary techniques that measures what goes on in the brain, things like functional magnetic resonance imaging, for instance, what you'll see is that the emotion centers of the brain turn on when people are asked to change. And this is bad because bringing emotions, because the emotions are typically negative emotions, bringing emotions into the exercise causes resistance and causes defensiveness. But once the emotions are over, then what we know is that when people need to do something differently, they have to learn. And so learning is crucial. And so we're gonna suggest that one of the reasons that people are wrongly labeled change resistant. And if you think of that, the human race is change resistant. I mean, we survived ice ages. We're the only animal that can live at the poles and at the equator. All the different lifestyles that people have across the world. Human beings are incredibly flexible, but we ask them to change in such a way that we fight with the natural tendencies of their brains. So change is learning, and that's a really key message in this presentation. Now, to get a little more specific about that, when you ask people to change anything, you're often asking them to achieve different outcomes. So, for instance, if you've got an organisation which is providing a particular service and customers want a different service, then you may have to achieve different outcomes to provide that different service. And it requires you to often execute different skills. And if you've had experiences which is similar to what you're going to have to do in future, well, that helps. And you might even have to change your attitudes and values in order to, to provide this changed or updated service. So you can see how crucial learning is, learning new outcomes, learning new skills, learning new experiences, learning new attitudes and values are necessary to be able to bring about the change that's going to be important for whatever the new undertaking is. So what that means is that we actually literally have to set up our change activities as learning activities. And in addition to that, we must create the preconditions of learning. And I'm going to talk a bit about the preconditions of learning later in this presentation. But basically, there are different times when our receptiveness of learning differs. So you can imagine, if you're ill, you are not 
as ready to learn than if you were healthy. If you are extremely tired or extremely frightened, you probably won't learn as well as you would if you were relatively more relaxed and broad-minded, but more on that point as we make our way through this presentation. But here's a classic psychologist question. I am a psychologist, I will fully and freely confess that, and I'm very interested in the question of why people vary in their receptiveness of change. And the answer is, like most things in human life, a mix of nature and nurture. So on the nature side of the equation here, you have things like cognitive ability, intelligence, IQ, aptitudes. They're all kind of code names for the same thing, how smart somebody is. Now, it turns out that that's probably about 60 to 80% genetically determined. You will get different results from different researchers. Everybody agrees that if you look at the twin studies, for instance, correlations between IQs of identical children separated at birth are way higher than the correlations in IQ of non-identical twins that grow up in the same family, for instance. So we know that there's a strong genetic component to intelligence. And if change is learning, then we know that how smart a person is affects the rate of learning. So all other things being equal, a smart person finds it easier to learn than somebody who has lower cognitive ability. Then you have personality, which is again, heavily genetically determined. And so again, the estimates vary from sort of 50% to 70% genetically determined. Um, I'm at the 70% end from recent studies that have been conducted across the world. Other people at the 50%, doesn't really matter. I think we all agree that the majority of personality is largely genetically determined. And personality has a big impact on how change ready people are. Then you have skills and changing requires certain skills. So in the nurture side here, skills are necessary. So you, if you're a really good listener or you're, you've got learning skills or you've learned how to learn, that's helpful. But also you have to learn these new skills to be able to do whatever the changed undertaking is. Experience, so our knowledge, our qualifications have a big impact on how change ready we are. And if we're asked to do something that's similar to what we've done in the past, well, not surprisingly, people tend to resist less and welcome more changes that are similar to what they've understood. And finally, we talk about attitudes and values. And if a person is asked to do something which they believe is very consistent with their values, not surprisingly, they're much more prepared to embrace it than if they're asked to do something which is very contrary or radical in comparison with their value set. So cognitive ability comes in three forms, actually it comes in a lot more forms, but these three are commonly measured in recruitment purposes. How smart a person is with words, how smart a person is with numbers, and abstract reasoning is really to do with problem solving, so strategy, tactics, those kinds of things. Smarter people learn more quickly. Now, I wanna make a draw a parallel, and this might sound a little controversial, but there is a very strong correlation between cognitive ability and income. So if a person is paid a lot of money, chances are they will have a higher cognitive ability than a person who is paid a, a small amount of money. Now, of course, that doesn't work very well at an individual level because there are people who are paid nothing and they are geniuses, and there are people who are paid a lot and they're not very smart at all. But if you take a population of people, let's say a thousand people, the correlation is really quite strong. The reason I make this point is that if you have an executive team sitting around an executive table strategizing to do something different and assuming that the lowly paid workers will simply get why we have to do this, I think that's a big mistake. And this is a really important tip for executives who are bringing about change. Don't assume that's what's obvious to you. And bear in mind, you've probably had all kinds of strategy discussions about the point, you've probably ventilated it with your colleagues. Don't just assume that it's as obvious to the people lower in the organization as it is to you. It may well be also, if you're dealing with a workforce as most are, that on balance is not quite as cognitively gifted as the higher levels in an organization. One of the things that you're gonna to have to be conscious of and careful about is to use multiple forms of communication to make sure that the message is getting through and people understand what's going on and they've had a chance to soak up why all of this is necessary. But further on that down the track in this presentation. 
So cognitive ability is a driver of speed of learning, but so is personality. This is a Hexaco model of personality. It's called the SAC-6. This is a work-worded personality instrument that SAC's developed. And one of the things that we know is that if you are a leader in change management, this characteristic called integrity modesty is a very big asset. Integrity modesty is the degree to which a person is likely to be genuine, uh, rule abiding, not uh, a cheat, likely not to be arrogant. And one of the things that I'm going to comment on, particularly for leaders, but not only for leaders, is that if you're undertaking change management, let me encourage you to be as authentic as you possibly can with everyone. I often see that organizations try to hold the truth back from staff because they want to protect them in some way or because they don't want to stampede the horses, make people fearful. I would encourage people to be as blunt as possible in change management, telling people the truth and telling them the blunt truth, we have to do this because of this, this and this. I think people far better accept that than if they sort of sense that maybe the truth is being held back from them. People underestimate the resilience of staff a lot, I think. It's far better, let's say we're in a situation where we have to do things because of commercial challenges. Let's be really honest about the commercial challenges and then trust people to come with us on that journey. If they feel that they can't come with us, well, maybe that's good too. If this is not a journey that they want to be on, then they make that decision and exit. The second component of change receptiveness is emotionality. People vary enormously in the degree to which they are emotionally stable or emotionally unstable. People who are emotionally stable are far better in change management situations than people who are emotionally unstable. People who are emotionally unstable, which means things like being threat sensitive, anxious, very dependent on other people, and overly empathic means that they sort of soak up the emotions of other people. What that means is that when change is happening, they're often very much more stressed than people who are low in emotionality. Very strong genetic component here, and it's, it's sad actually if somebody is gifted a personality which is highly emotional, because I'm sure you've had this experience where somebody is really suffering, you know, well-being is down because they're responding very negatively to something that, well, maybe you feel comfortable about it or colleagues feel comfortable about it. So emotionality is a challenge. It's also part of resilience. When emotionality is low, in other words, somebody is emotionally stable, that's a component of the thing called resilience, which means that a person is likely to cope. Extroversion, introversion, slight effect on change readiness. Yes, extroverts are slightly more change ready than introverts, largely because they tend to be a little bit more cheerful and optimistic about, okay, well, you know, it'll just all work out to the good, but it's a slight difference. I'm not in any way saying prefer extroverts or introverts generally, although if you're recruiting a sales rep, probably better if it's an introvert, and if you're recruiting somebody to do a very thoughtful, reflective job where they have to sit behind a computer screen and do analytical work, then probably that might suit an introvert better because they won't feel frustrated by the absence of social contact. Conscientiousness. People who are conscientiousness, uh, sorry, people who are conscientious tend to be organized, committed to hard work, detail-minded, and they're thoughtful rather than impulsive in making decisions. So this is a driver of change readiness because people who are conscientious like to achieve outcomes and will persist and will commit to learning rather than throwing up their hands in horror if change happens. They tend to go the course. Now, emotionality and conscientiousness are two components of resilience, and so is this extroversion component here, cheerfulness and optimism. So a truly resilient person is somebody who is emotionally stable, hardworking and energetic, and typically an optimist. That's the sort of personality recipe, if you like, for being resilient. And resilience, we know, makes people more change ready. Then you have this characteristic called absence of anger. Now, if you've undertaken change management, you'll find that one of the key results of any change effort is anger. People become angry. I'll explain why when we get to the neuroscience part of this presentation. But it's good to recruit people who are relatively low in anger. So they're unlikely to be harsh, unlikely to carry a grudge, and they don't get angry very quickly. That's helpful in change management. 
And finally, from a personality point of view, the king of change readiness is a thing called openness to experience. Openness to experience is really a genetic tendency to like new things. When somebody is high in openness to experience, they just welcome new things. They like them. If somebody's low, well, they might well be the sort of person who simply prefers the familiar and doesn't like change. So personality is a very big driver. So ideally, if somebody's quite smart and quite resilient and quite broad minded, that's a kind of a change agent personality. Going to the nurture side of the equation, we have a person's value set. So we developed a thing called the Sachs Work Value Scales, been normed and validated against the Schwartz Portrait Values Questionnaire, which is a very widely cited research instrument. And uh, we discovered 11 values very similar to Schwartz's 10, but you'll see that some of these relate to change readiness. So traditional, traditional values, people who are very high on traditional values will believe that change may not be a good thing because they believe that the traditional way things have been done is helpful. You see, there's a value here called variety. And variety is really a belief that it's a good thing to do a range of different and new things in your work life. And then safety. If people are very high on the value of safety, that also might engender a sense of resistance to change because of the fact that maybe people see a threat in change. Now, values are not genetic. They are largely learned in the course of a person's life which actually means that they have less impact on people's behaviors than personality does, because if my personality, which is genetically determined, is telling me to do something, well, you know, that, that's a very strong push. But values are what we have learned to believe in. So if a person has a value set that complements their personality in liking change, well, it's a little bit of a help along in that respect. So that's why people vary in their receptiveness to change. And we all, at SACS, we have a change resistance measure, which many people use in recruitment. And this, you'll see that this person has registered with a low score of 44, which means that their change resistance risk is low. So that's only about six questions or something. And quite often people add that to other measures like personality and cognitive ability. Very easy to assess people's change resistance. I want to talk a little bit now about the preconditions of change and learning. So I mentioned earlier in the intro that uh, people's readiness to change does vary over the course of a month, a year, maybe a day, depending on their situation. But one of the things that we know, this is from the world of positive psychology, that the levels of positive emotion that people have does affect their receptiveness to change, their broad mindedness. So Barbara Fredrickson, who is a positive psychologist, has developed a theory called the broaden and build theory. And what she's identified, and this is backed very heavily by empirical research, is that the level of positive emotions that people have does affect how broad minded they are. So when positive emotions increase, people broaden their perspective. So just to look at this, maybe an alternative way of looking at it is when people become sad and depressed, they often limit what they do. They often sort of retreat into maybe home and ultimately if they become clinically depressed, it may be difficult for them sadly to get out of bed. So if you can increase the levels of positive emotion for anybody, they tend to become more broad minded. But when they do the new things, novel thoughts, activities, relationships, that tends to build skills. And so that's this is the broaden bit and this is the build, skid, uh, build bit. In other words, people build social support, they build skills. You can imagine at work, if I'm broad-minded enough to do something I've never done before, well, the human brain has evolved to love learning. And it means that once I've learned this new thing, firstly, I feel good about it. So I'm gonna get a little burst of reward chemicals in my brain that make me feel good about that. But then in addition to that, I'm likely to be able to step further into new things because of the skills I've built. Now, at an individual level, we know that when people have this broaden and build effect. They get enhanced health, survival even, and they get fulfillment. And that then plugs back into positive emotions. So in effect, you can create an upward spiral. So Barbara Fredrickson was speaking mainly at an individual level, but the same thing applies at an organizational level. And when we talk about 
positive emotions at an organisation level, we often talk about a thing called work engagement. This is a summary of an article from a gentleman by the name of Backer in 2011. And Backer, with his colleague Demaruti, undertook a number of meta-analyses. A meta-analysis is where you re-analyse the data from multiple studies. And what they were able to identify is that engagement, positive emotions at work, have three important characteristics. First is a sense of vigour. Vigour means people are energetic. They want to get to work. They're enjoying what they're doing. Dedication is a sort of a commitment to what we do, a sense of significance and challenge in the work that we do. And absorption is really a case of where people get dragged into or get sucked into, happily sucked into the work that they're doing and the team that they belong to. They get engrossed in what they're doing. And this is great because when people are absorbed in their work in this way, it makes them more productive. Now, when Becker and Demaruti started writing these articles in the uh, late 2000s, sorry, the early 2000s and uh, beyond, what they were able to identify is that there's a very strong business case for this model of work engagement because it predicts internal outcomes like productivity and it predicts things like absenteeism. So higher work engagement means lower negatives, but it also predicts some really important things externally. So it predicts profitability. When you have higher levels of work engagement, you get better profit and profit growth than organizations that have low levels of work engagement. It also predicts customer satisfaction. So if you have customers, having a highly engaged workforce is great for those customers. When employees are very engaged, they tend to have highly engaged and satisfied customers. So this diagram really explains what drives people's positive emotions at work and therefore their change receptiveness. Now, I wanna make a really important point about work engagement. People talk to me all the time about a phenomenon called change fatigue. Change fatigue is where people don't wanna change anymore. They say I've had done enough changes and they simply start resisting or maybe they just simply don't have the energy to pursue whatever program of change is taking place in the organization. I'm gonna draw a parallel between change fatigue and engagement. Change fatigue is low levels of this. Anytime we've been asked about change resistance or change fatigue, it's amazing how reliably, if you measure the levels of work engagement, and we have instruments to do this, you'll see that you get low levels of engagement in the workforce. And if you've got low levels of engagement in the workforce, the absence of the positive emotions, you've, you've in effect lost the broaden and build perspective. And so people start to feel tired, they start to resist change. So if you've got change resistance, I would encourage you very strongly to measure the levels of engagement in your workforce, and you may well find that it's low. So what causes engagement? Really, this is the thing called the job demands and resources model of engagement. That's what this diagram is. This is from the work of Backer and Demaruti, as mentioned earlier. And there are the job resources, the resources that cause a person to be engaged, and that's why that arrow is coming out to work engagement, come in two categories. One is personal resources, and personal resources are the things that we've mentioned already. A person's cognitive ability, their skills, we like to do stuff we're skilled in, their personality, if the person is inclined towards change, that's a personal resource that causes them to be change ready and to be more engaged. Then you have job resources, and the job resources are really fourfold. They're things like the, the work that I'm doing is a job resource, so if I love my work, well, not surprisingly, I'm more engaged. Second is my colleagues. If I'm in a team which is positive and committed and energetic, then again, I'm much more likely to be engaged. The third component is the leader that I report to. If I've got a good leader, I'm much more likely to be engaged. And finally, the organization that I work for is a driver of my engagement. Although the first three, job, team and leader, are much more important than the organization because they're local to me. I experience them every day. So if you are getting change resistance, one of the questions you have to ask is, have you built the personal resources in the employees necessary to do whatever the new thing is? Because if you ask a person to do something that they are simply not 
trained to do, or probably from a psychological point of view, the more important thing is, are they confident to do this? If they are not confident, then you have to assume that they won't be engaged with whatever it is because they don't have the personal resources to do it. Similarly, if they've got cynical, difficult colleagues or leaders, or you know the work is boring and repetitive and they're not learning, then again, expect them not to be engaged. So that's the job resources bit of this equation. The next bit is job demands. And job demands come in two forms. You have positive job demands, so positive job demands are things like I'm doing work which is challenging and I have to exercise a lot of thinking to get this work done. The reason we call these positive demands is that they actually tend to increase levels of engagement. So when people are doing lots of really challenging, interesting work, that's not bad for them. That tends to make them more engaged. The negative demands are things like work ambiguity. I don't know exactly what my job is supposed to deliver. That's a negative demand. Another one would be, hey, people are fighting here. You know, my colleagues are fighting with each other. By the way, if customers are difficult, that's a problem. If colleagues are different, that's 10 times difficult. That's 10 times the problem. So job demands can be in positive and negative form, but whatever is closest to me in both the demands and resources are the things that affect my engagement most strongly. Now, when a person has high levels of engagement, we know that there is a link between engagement and job performance. People who are more engaged perform better, both in a quantitative and a qualitative sense. But then that contributes back to a thing called job crafting. And job crafting is crucial for change management. Job crafting is where employees stand back from their job and seek to do things better. Instead of working in their job, they work on their job. When people do this, they also increase their personal resources, they learn new skills, and they also increase their job resources because they build new relationships with people, they build confidence, they build trust, they build an understanding with their leader. So job crafting is much to be desired. It's a really positive way of achieving change. And so in this presentation, and in particular when we get to the neuroscience stuff, I'll be explaining that the most effective form of change management is in fact a sponsored form of job crafting where the organization seeks to cause job crafting to happen and to cause it to happen a lot. So this is just a few points on job crafting, really just exemplifying what I've said. It's about collaboration. It's about redesigning jobs to do them better. It's about improving things. Now, if you have levels of positive emotion which are too low, there's a number of things that you can do to make people more positive, more optimistic, and more resilient. One of the things that can be really helpful is to reduce focus on the past and concentrate on the future, making plans about how to get there. I'm gonna explain when the neuroscience section of this presentation rolls around that what you focus on is absolutely crucial to your success in change management. Focusing on the past tends to lead people to be rooted in the past. Focusing on the future, and by that I don't mean necessarily the future two, three, four years down the track. Focusing on the future can be as simple as saying, all right, what are we looking forward to achieving this week? What are we going to get done this week? Focusing on the near term can be extremely powerful for people's commitment, energy, and optimism. People who are connected with the future in general have higher levels of well-being. We also should talk about the balance of positive versus negative. And you've probably heard, the, um, you've definitely heard of the idea of the glass half full and the glass half empty. Did you know that on balance, the value of a negative is in fact probably between three and six times as strong as the value of a positive. So just to translate that, if, if I say something negative to you, I will affect your well-being. I probably have to say between three and six positive things just to get you back where you were before I said anything. So I think that it's really important if you wanna have a ch an effective change management environment, you've gotta try and sponsor this idea of, well, let's focus on what we can do. Let's focus on what we're here to achieve. Let's focus on the future rather than 
focusing on complaining or focusing on grousing. You know, one of the things that I think is really important in leadership, we should understand that if you sponsor and allow an environment where people are saying negative things to each other, what we're doing is that we're sponsoring an environment which is more likely to damage people's well-being. The research evidence for this is impeccable. Negativity hurts people. So we must try to create an environment where we spontaneously, but also explicitly, generating congratulations for people who are looking on the positive side. Now, I don't mean cockeyed optimism here. Cockeyed optimism is not good for anybody where you say, don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. The sort of optimism that we're talking about is what a gentleman by the name of Albert Bandura would have called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is all about, okay, we can do this, we can cope. I'm confident that together we will get through this. I'm confident that together we will come up with a great result. That's a focus on the future and a focus on positives. Another really good activity to increase people's levels of positive emotions is the three blessings. So let's say you have a meeting and everybody's a little bit down. Why don't we get a, three people to talk about good things that happened to them in the course of the week? By the way, it works best if you forewarn them that that's what you're going to do, but it can be useful. We often, it's, it's another way of trying to avoid focusing on negatives. A learned optimism exercise. Maybe you finish your meeting by saying, all right, well, what are we looking forward to achieving this week? What are we looking forward to enjoying this week? Uh, by the way, just uh, on this point, if you want to improve things at work, it's far better to focus on work stuff. You know, people often like to send people away whitewater rafting. I mean, I'm telling you this story in the middle of COVID-19, so people really aren't doing that kind of stuff at the moment. Send people away white water rafting, send people away to I don't know, do activities where climbing rocks, whatever. Look, that's fine. But if you want to improve things at work, do stuff that focuses on work. Helping people to build their interpersonal relationships on non-work related stuff. Yeah, that's fine. It's worth doing. But it's far more powerful to get everybody together and say, let's improve the workplace. So a learned optimism exercise is focusing on look, what do we have to look forward to? Acts of generosity. Did you know that human beings have evolved for in such a way that generosity is very valuable? It's a thing called convivence. That's what the, posit the social psychologists call it. Convivence means we live together. And so we are, we have evolved to be generous to other people. We get a blast out of being generous to other people. And certainly if people are depressed, one of the things that clinical psychologists often do is encourage them to undertake random acts of kindness. And those acts of kindness have a couple of effects. One is that they build relationships with other people, but second, they build our self-efficacy, they build our sense of self-strength. Because if I'm a victim, I can't be generous. So the moment I start being generous, I'm proving to myself that I'm not a victim, or I'm not only a victim, if you want to put it that way. Signature strength exercises. Get the group together and get them to discuss and agree what they're really good at as a group. Signature strengths are the strengths that are uniquely ours. So that's a powerful thing to do. And if you want to learn more about that, you might like to go to Martin Seligman's website, S-E-L-I-G-M-A-N, and his website is called Authentic Happiness, and he has signature strength questionnaires to be done at an individual level. But how about a work group activity where you get the group together and they break into small groups, come up with ideas about what we're really good at as a group, and then get them to vote for them, and then plan how you're gonna use those signature strengths to improve what we do. That can be really, really powerful. Uh, and it will markedly improve for a short period of time the levels of positive emotion in a work group. Mindfulness activities such as meditation. I don't really have time to go into mindfulness, but mindfulness activities um, can be very powerful in increasing people's resilience. But then ultimately forming collaborative work groups to work together to create an ideal future. Now, I don't mean this in some kind of spiritual way. I mean, let's fix this so it's as good as it can possibly be. Instead of trying to optimize customer service, let's say, by focusing on the complaints, let's define what optimum customer service is, and then let's get together as work groups to plan how we're gonna cause these customers to feel this way about us. That's a really positive activity.
and I'll go into that in more detail as we go through the presentation. So how does all this happen? How do we get this broad Barbara Fredrickson broaden and build effect happening? How do we get positive engagement in our workforces? Well, largely it's down to leader behaviors. Leaders are the key drivers of all of this. And this is the results of a study that Sachs undertook with Deakin University. This was about 2017, 2018, I believe. And we measured the levels of engagement. We used a thing called the Utrecht Work Engagement Scale. We measured the levels of engagement of somewhere around 2,700 people across all different industry sectors. And then we measured a range of leader behaviors. And you see 10 are mentioned here. These were 10 that were extremely statistically significant. There were a bunch of others that we put into this equation, but they didn't measure up quite as strongly. So there were 10 that were really, really powerful, but four of them were the most powerful. And so this gives you an indication of the type of leadership that's likely to work well in a rapidly changing environment, leadership for change management. And you'll see that the number one behavior that increases levels of engagement for staff is encourages autonomous decision-making. Now, again, to decode that, encourages autonomous decision-making, people would call that empowerment. What it's about is where leaders encourage staff to make as often as possible their own decisions. So just think of it this way. If you want people to be highly engaged, the most powerful thing you can do is to turn over some power to them. Not all the time. And I'll talk about the different styles of leadership as we go through this presentation. But if you never empower people, then you are giving away the possibility of getting levels of engagement higher than about, let's say 50, 55 percentile in comparison with the organization. When we see organizations that have low levels of empowerment, we virtually never see high levels of engagement. So leaders need to be empowering. Second, they need to be optimistic and positive. And again, optimism and positivity is really about, hey, we'll get through this. We can cope with this. I know that we are a good team. I know that we're going to succeed. That's the sort of optimism and positive positivity that we're talking about. Good leaders are also supportive. They support people in terms of their personal life. Hey, you need time to go to do this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, you can have it. But they also support people in their professional life. You need to build these skills. I'll help you to do that. You want experience of this type of work. If I can, I'll provide that opportunity. And then finally, creates a learning environment. And when people are, do, are provided with these three things, they're encouraged to make their own decision. Leadership is positive and optimistic about their capacity to do it. And it's supportive of them building their career and their personal life. Then that creates a learning environment. And we know that people are most passionate when they're learning something new. The human brain has evolved to be really hooked into learning. It loves to learn. <clears throat> so you might like to consider measuring the levels of engagement. So this is an example of a team where 123 four people involved in this team, you see their levels of engagement is at the 32nd percentile, which is uh, below population average. This is population average for this, uh, for organizations in Australia and New Zealand. And what you see here is that uh, the three components of engagement, which we call energy commitment and flow, uh, you see very low levels of energy, so only the 21st percentile. That line there, by the way, is population average. The flow, 36th percentile, so relatively low, and commitment, 40th percentile, which is again below population average, but not as bad as energy in particular. So if this organization can get this group to have higher levels of engagement, then they're going to get less change fatigue and more change receptiveness. They will have created the preconditions of change. Now, I want to talk to you about an approach to change, which in effect collaborates with rather than fights the brains of employees. This is a thing that we've called destination based change. And we'll explain why destination, but it really comes down to what you focus on. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about the neuroscience of change. Did you know that what you focus on and what you are concerned with at any particular time turns off and turns on different parts of your brain? So here's a beautiful little diagram of the human brain and it mentions a range of different components of the brain. 
If you're going to undertake familiar tasks, things that you've done a lot, those familiar tasks tend to be performed in a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. Now you'll notice that you've got a nice pink outer part of the brain. We'll call that the new brain. The inner part of the brain, including the cerebellum and the hippocampus, we'll call that the old brain. Why? This bit evolved more recently. This bit evolved a long time ago. And not only that, the old brain, if you compare it with other animals, compares quite favorably in the sense, or, or compares quite closely. In other words, it's really the new brain. It's the, the, the real cortex part, the outer cortex, that differentiates us from, let's say, other great apes like chimpanzees. Now, familiar tasks tend to be undertaken in the old brain, at basal ganglia, don't worry about the name if it doesn't interest you. But what that means is that familiar tasks often take place very unconsciously because the old brain is not very conscious. So if you learn to drive a car, as you're learning to drive a car, you will be very conscious of changing gears and indicating and doing all those things. But once you've learned to drive a car, it's as though the car drives itself, isn't it? Why? Because the tasks have been drawn down from the new brain. The prefrontal cortex is where we learn new things. And they've been drawn down to the point where they've become very familiar and they're being done by the old brain and they're being done in the basal ganglia. Now, from a practical point of view, this is important because many of the tasks that we've done in the past are unconscious and done unconsciously. And it, there are estimates, by the way, that human beings might spend up to 70% of their time on autopilot almost, not really consciously thinking about things, but just doing things. But the moment you have to do something new, you have to use the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex has a very big difference from the basal ganglia or several very big differences. One is that it's conscious, but the second is that it's far more energy consumptive. So for instance, if you focus on the future, if you strategize, if you reflect, you will get far more tired than if you're just doing the same old stuff over and over. And this is one of the reasons why people resist change. If you've been in a strategy meeting in recent times, you'll know how tired you are at the end of that strategy meeting. Also, when you learn to drive a car, you might remember sitting on the couch after a lesson thinking, wow, I'm really tired, perhaps having a cup of tea or something stronger if that's your taste. But in any event, new tasks, new brain functions are much more energy consumptive than old brain functions. And that's why we tend to slip back to old ways of doing things, because the human brain will find the cheapest way of doing things. Another reason people resist change is that around about here is a part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex. And that scans the world for threats. It scans the world for things that are potentially dangerous. Now, if you are listening to this, then you clearly have a prefrontal cortex and you clearly have an orbitofrontal cortex as well. Because without it, when people have damage to the orbitofrontal cortex, they often do incredibly reckless things. and They don't realize how threatening they are. This is part of the brain which is very important. And the reason that the presentation is called Change Without Pain is that one of the functions or one of the things that happens when the orbitofrontal cortex is turned on is that it causes pain, it causes discomfort. So if you've ever had the feeling of being frightened by something and you get that terrible feeling in your stomach, then that's one of the, the examples of the type of pain that the orbitofrontal cortex turns on. It's also one of the reasons why people resist change. It will become, that pain sensation will become linked to certain names, for instance. So um, let's say your company has a project called Project Phoenix. I've seen people wince when they hear the name. You know, they're not conscious of wincing, but that triggers the orbitofrontal cortex response. And when people uh, get this error message, that's the thing that engenders this sense of pain, and it, it's why people resist and move away from whatever it is. So how? let's get practical again. What do I mean? Well, I, you're asking me to do this. This is against my values. You're asking me to do this. I don't understand why you want me to do this. You're asking me to do this. I think that's stupid. You haven't talked to me about how my job works and it's not going to work. So those are all orbitofrontal cortex responses. And that will cause the person to have pain. And when they have pain, 
they are going to seek to avoid whatever it is that you're asking them to get involved in. But as well as that, what happens is that when the orbitofrontal cortex turns on, it also turns on the amygdala. These are small things way down in the old brain, and that gives rise to the fight, flight, and freeze response. And the fight response tends to be an anger response. The flight response tends to be a fear response. And the freeze response tends to be a depression response. And that's where our old brain emotions tend to come from. They were there to fuel the fight, flight, and freeze response. Now, all this stuff evolved back in the days when we used to get eaten by saber-toothed tigers. And all of this was evolved to deal with short-term threats. And so, you know, you get about to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, well, you either get away or you don't. You either beat the saber-toothed tiger up, which is the fight response, or you jump into a tree and run away from the saber-toothed tiger, that's the flight response, or you might have the freeze response, in which case you don't know what to do and you hunker down on the ground and, well, maybe you're gonna get eaten under those circumstances, but short-termism. Now, the difference in modern life is that our problems and our challenges are not short-term. I'm talking to you at about the six month mark of the COVID-19 crisis here in Victoria, and it is still absolutely live. And what we're finding is that people have been in fight and flight and fear, freeze mode for maybe six months or, or on the verge of it. And this is extremely taxing. So how do you bring about change? What you have to do is you have to gently lead people away from the familiar way of doing things by introducing effectively new ideas and new approaches and new techniques and new skills into their way of doing things. And you have to do it in such a way that you dodge the perception of errors so you don't turn on the amygdala and get the fight, flight and freeze response. Now, I mentioned that this all evolved a very long time ago, and that's true. But the common modern forms of the fight, flight and freeze response are things like absenteeism. I mean, that can be fight. I'm not coming to work if you're going to do this. It can be flight. Well, I can't cope, so I'm not coming to work. It can be, so can resignation. You know, I'm going to quit. Fight response or flight response. So these things are what you might call, what Sigmund Freud would have called, sublimated versions of the fight and fright, flight and fight and flight and freeze response. So what we have to do is develop a method of coping more effectively with this. This diagram is the same thing, but this is from the Human Connectome Project, where they sought to map, and as you can see, they did map, uh, the main neural pathways in the human brain. You see the separation here between the old brain and the new brain. So just to briefly recap about the new brain versus the old brain, the old brain evolved to focus on the past. Its emotions are anger, fear, and depression. It's largely unconscious, and it tends to be quite resistant to change. The new brain, largely driven by the prefrontal cortex, is able to focus on the future, collaboration, affiliation, goodwill, optimism, the seat of consciousness, in other words, it's the conscious part of the brain, and it's the driver of change and learning. So, my point here is that we have to try to be new brain organizations. Now, how do we do this? You've got to understand some very interesting things about the human brain. Firstly, the human brain does not speed up or slow down as a system. So I'll go back to our human connectome diagram. The amount of glucose and oxygen that this cons consumes in the course of a day doesn't vary very much at all, only a few percentage points, uh, research indicates. So that's quite unusual because, for instance, if you go to the gym and you do biceps curls, your biceps will draw more energy from the rest of your body. The human brain doesn't operate like that. When you turn on one part of the human brain, you turn, tend to turn off other parts of the human brain. So I'll go back even further, I'll go back to this. So perception of errors. I am the mild-mannered accountant from Ringwood. I'm going home. Ringwood, for those of you who are not in Victoria or Melbourne, is an eastern suburb, a leafy eastern suburb, where accountants live a lot. So the mild-mannered accountant from Ringwood is on his way home and he's had a very stressful day and he's gonna be late for his daughter's birthday party. And so he's driving along and somebody cuts him off. And all of a sudden his amygdala gets turned on and he becomes extremely angry. Now that the amygdala is turned on, 
the prefrontal cortex loses the energy which otherwise would have been dedicated to it. And what that means is that the only part of the brain that could see the future is now inactive. So the emotions are back in the days of the cave dweller and the person is very angry. And you know what? He undertakes an act of road rage. Later on, he might be inclined to say, you know, I don't even know who did that. Was that really me? Well, yeah, it was the old brain. And what that means is that what we have to try to do as we undertake change is to be a new brain organization. And so we're gonna to choose to lead learning in such a way that we turn on the new brain. That means we focus on the future. It means we focus on reflection. It means we focus on solutions rather than problems. We focus on feed forward rather than feedback. Now let me explain what that means. Feedback is where I tell you what you did good and what you did bad about something that you've done for me. Mary Smith, this is a great report in these areas, but it's no good in these areas. That's feedback. Feed forward is where you give people guidance, which is targeted specifically on the future. Feed forward is where you say to Mary Smith, Mary, this report needs to improve in the following ways in order to be good enough to be sent to a client. So if we could do this differently and let's give you some tips about how to improve this, that's feed forward. Feed forward can be shown to occasion much greater rates of change and growth and learning than feedback. Let me be clear, people hate feedback. If you don't believe this, walk up to somebody and say, I have some feedback for you and watch their nonverbals. You will see that people hate feedback and what you're getting when they, you get that sort of rather defensive look is you're seeing the amygdala being turned on. Now, the right focus therefore causes the benefits of change, enthusiasm, positive emotions and engagement. So this is just a little bit of a tip on feed forward. Feel free to review this in more detail if you want to. Uh, but I guess one of the things that is important is you can be very assertive about expectations but you do it in such a way that you don't really trigger the old brain. Telling people what they've done wrong embodies a natural sense of helplessness. How can I change the past? Telling them what you want them to do differently in future is optimistic of its very nature. You're saying, I believe you can do this. And as we say there, it can be shown to occasion much more significant change. Now, accidentally turning on the old brain does lead to collateral damage. And collateral damage can be things like absenteeism, it can be things like resignations, it can be things like politics. Why? They're all manifestations of the ancient fight, flight and freeze response. And so we need to avoid that. So can change be achieved? Well, yeah, it can, but not in the old fashioned ways to like the carrot will reward you or the stick I'll punish you or simply expecting people to fall in line. That's where Change, change efforts have often failed in the past. So, a really, really important, folk, uh, important key for change is focus. Our brains take us toward what we focus on. Now, I don't mean that in some theoretical kind of way. I gave a presentation to a group once and it turned out that one of the participants was a motocross rider. And this individual was in fact a champion of motocross. And afterwards he came up to me and he said, you know, that's so true. Uh, when I'm riding uh, motocross, the last thing you do is focus on the obstacles. You pick the safest blade of grass or the safest piece of gravel and you take your wheel over that. You focus fiercely on the safe bit. Golfers, be people who are involved in tournament golf, they know the last thing you do is stand on the tee and focus on trying not to hit the ball in the water because that's where the ball's gonna go. You focus on a blade of grass 300 meters down the, the uh, fairway and you picture landing the ball, stopping the ball on that blade of grass. Fiercely you focus on that. So change undertakings often focus on what's wrong, but let me tell you, the word change itself is an insult. You go to a group of people and you say, you need to change. This is an exercise in change management. Please avoid that word. Culture change is even more of an insult. We need to change our culture. I mean, if people are proud of the organization that they work for, and they should be, if you've recruited well, they should be, then that's just terrible. That is an insult. So 
Your alternative is to focus on something far more positive and effective. And how you lead this is down to three different choices. There are three different ways of leading this. By the way, I'm gonna give you an alternative suggestion of focus. But you remember that we demonstrated that if you want to have high levels of engagement, what you've got to have is empowerment. And the levels of empowerment that you bring to the exercise really come down to three leadership styles. To be a good leader, you have to be able to be top down, where you're going to tell people what they need to do. You can't be a good leader without doing that. Secondly, you need to be able to consult people. This is where I go out and ask people what they think, and then I make my decision based on what they tell me. But the third level of leadership is facilitative leadership, where you get the people together, you encourage them maybe to break into small groups and come up with solutions, and you would get them to actually vote for what they think should be done. And then the true facilitative leader will go with what the group decides. So in each issue, you decide, do I want to be the boss? Do I want to be the consultant? Or do I want to be the facilitator? And if I'm going to be the facilitator, and you should do this from time to time, because this is what increases people's confidence, their self-efficacy, and their levels of engagement. So good leaders choose when to be top down. And being authentic about, hey, this is the non-negotiable bit. The board has decided, the chief executive has decided, the good Lord on high has decided we have to do that. Just be blunt with them. You might consult to see whether you need to go to facilitation, but facilitation should be used for the really sensitive stuff. And even if you told them this bit's not negotiable, run a facilitation where you say, all right, well, how are we gonna implement this? And then go with what they tell you. A good facilitative leader brings a process rather than bringing the content. And that's what causes people to be highly engaged. So you might do it with an elected group of representative staff. In other words, you get a group of staff who have been voted up by their colleagues. I recommend not using volunteers. Volunteers are typically unrepresentative of their colleagues. So when we do big change management exercises for clients, we typically run a process where employees vote for people who they consider to be a good representative group. We often use very large groups too. We've often done projects where you'd have a group, let's say there's 600 employees, and you'd have a group of 100. In fact, I can't understand why people want a small army when they could have a large army. And it's really good to have a full representation of viewpoints. So people will vote up into this representative group, people who are negative. Great, you want that. You don't want to find that out when you're then later on trying to implement. And you undertake a process of empowerment plus accountability. And just to explain how that works, the authenticity bit, yes, you're going to explain to people and be very blunt with them about what is the, the truth of the situation. You're gonna set the ground rules up front. Here are a couple of ground rules that we've often used. We talk only about the future. We respect everyone in and out of the room and empower the group as fully as possible within these degrees of freedom. Don't just consult them, get them to do the change. Don't ask them to be passengers, ask them to actually do the change. People learn by doing. So to put it all together, here is a suggestion. Now I suggested that it's a bad thing to focus on change. I suggested it's a bad thing to focus on the past. I'm gonna suggest it's a good thing to develop a clear destination. That's where we're gonna head. And to get that really clear and to get that shared in amongst all of the participants in this exercise and to get them to focus on that destination. Elaborate it, enunciate it, make sure we all know what we're talking about and move towards it. This technique is called DROP, destination, reality, checking, option creation, planning, doing, and reflection. Now, I would have loved to have come up with a more attractive acronym than DROP, but I couldn't. So there's my authentic contribution to this presentation today. So we'll go through each of the stages. So destination setting, what's the end point? Where will we be when we have succeeded? So some examples here, when we've finished this project, what will the end product be? And we wanna be really specific. I want you to write this report. Let's discuss and agree how long it will be, what audience it's intended for, etc. I wanna be a better leader. What would my staff say about me if I were the best leader I could be? Another example, we want really good customer service. Let's agree what we want our customers to say about us. Human beings are led towards their destinations. When they have a clear destination in mind, it works. 
because it, it creates shared clarity, creates enthusiasm, creates optimism and a focus on the past, a focus on the future. So we know where we're going and it creates esprit de corps. Reality checking is how far are we from our destination? And I like to make this numerical when I do it, largely because coming up with these numerical ideas is very much a new brain idea. It's only the new brain that can do this. And that turns on the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of thoughtfulness. So you might say, well, okay, well, how big a deal is this to me? Zero means not an issue at all. 10 means it's the most important thing going. How urgent is this? How far am I from the ideal? Zero means we're as far as possible as we can be from it. Tens means I'm perfect, nothing needs to change. The value of reality checking, and, and by the way, the reality check is best done when you get them to do the reality check, get them to come up with the numbers, average the numbers. I've done this with up to 200 people, I think was my biggest group where I did this. You average the number and they say, okay, well, we think we're a three out of 10 right now. And you say, okay, well, what do you make of a three out of 10? And they will say to you, well, we've got a lot of change to. We've got a lot of things that we've got to improve here. So the value is that it's a new brain exercise and it gets the benefits of new brain emotions. Option creation. Get small groups of people. Say, let's say you've got your 100 people or your 20 or your five or whatever. Split them into small groups and get them to come up with really good ways of improving the issue, whatever the issue is. I've done this with organizational restructures. I've done it with, um, I remember once I did it with an, an aged care organization. Their issue was that they didn't know where, how to effectively store their equipment. And so I led a group of employees through an exercise, the drop exercise, destination, what would really good storage look like? Where are we now? I think there were three out of 10 or four or something. Where do we want to be in six months time? Well, we want to be about a seven or an eight because this is really important. I got them to come up with ideas, split them into small groups, and they came up with really good ideas about how to improve this. We captured them all and then we voted on them. Or well, they voted on them. I didn't get votes in this exercise. But this tends to kill off traditional approaches because it's a brainstorming exercise, it generates genuinely new ideas, it's exciting, it's empowering, gets people to think very widely. I mean, it, it uses the Barbara Fredrickson broaden and build perspective. And then when you do the P, the planning and doing and evaluating, you evaluate the ideas and you might say to people, use a value effort equation. In other words, change, choose rather the things that are high in value, they're gonna make a big difference and they're easy to do. That's starting with the low hanging fruit. But in any event, you get people to vote for the things that they think will work. And once they vote, then what will happen is that you'll agree, let's say three things to be committed to, formalize some action points, a clear deliverable outcome, who needs to be involved. And one of the things that I strongly recommend is get people who are involved in the group to actually lead these activities, empower them to lead. Now, as you can see, once you've done this, then you need to agree a schedule of meetings to review and drive progress. Make sure that the action points get done. Develop a promise keeping culture where people know once we commit to something, it's gonna happen. People will be proud of that. Review the destination every so often. It may well change when the progress is made. You know, when you do this enough, organizations start to do this automatically and it encourages staff instead of coming to you for solutions, to come to you with suggestions, to come to you with uh, ideas of their own. It encourages people to be empowered. So this becomes a, a program of flexibility through empowerment, new brain culture. So we have an action planning kit. If people want this, email us and we'll provide this. It, it's really just a guided way to do this. But in effect, this is sponsored job crafting. So what do we know about change? Well, it really helps to recruit change ready employees and you can do that. But of course you have the employees that you've got already. And one of the things that we encourage you to do is to stop fighting your employees' brains, create the preconditions for change by ensuring that you have satisfactory levels of engagement and avoid the old fashioned forms of consultation and emphasize empowerment and accountability. If you have empowerment and accountability, you're going to create a situation where people bring a sense of optimism and engagement to what they do, and you're gonna end up with far less change resistance and change fatigue. So the keys, focus, empowerment, leadership which respects 
the capability of staff and takes an optimistic view of how people can deliver the change that's necessary. Don't use the term change. You can understand that if you use the drop technique, you can go through an entire change effort without ever mentioning the word change. So there's some ideas about how you might occasion change. And if you want to avoid change fatigue, the key is make this as collaborative and empowering as possible. But you also have the right to set this within a framework of staff, colleagues. These bits are not negotiable. These bits are top down and we're going to go with these. Thanks very much for listening and may your change efforts prosper.